Okay. We're gonna start uh, right in with the next panel, which uh, to people in this room needs very little uh, introduction. Uh, the great John O'Sullivan, of course. Uh, Fred Kagan of AEI, brilliant military historian. And Pete Haig says, who may be uh, on Fox News these days more often than Charles Krauthammer. Right? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, Pete's an a American war hero, now runs uh, <coughs> Concerned <coughs> Veterans for America, and he's what I want to be when I grow up. That never happens. Um, let's, uh, Senator Cotton had a lot of very powerful things uh, to say about Iran, and I think one of the ones that, that hit home to me is we've had this almost obsession in terms of concentration, and this is not just an Obama problem, this goes back even before Obama, on the nuclear weapons aspect of the Iranian threat, when it's, it's been my contention, at least for some time, uh, and, and I'm not alone in this, I don't think, uh, that the regime is the problem. There's a lot of uh, regimes and a lot of governments with nuclear weapons. They don't keep us up at night uh, the way the Iranians do. Uh, Fred, you've testified recently in Congress about this, about how the Iranian threat actually transcends the problem of nuclear weapons. you want to uh, address that? Sure. It's, um, you know, it, it's a remarkable uh, phenomenon in all of our discussions about Iran that we compartmentalize all of these issues that the Iranian regime does not compartmentalize. Um, and so we are treating the nuclear program separate from all other things um, as if the Iranians thought about it separately. Uh, why do the Iranians want <coughs> a nuclear arsenal? Uh, they want a nuclear arsenal because they want to cement their hegemony in the region and because they want to exclude the United States and the West from having any presence in the region and having any role in the region. But the pursuit of a nuclear weapon is not the only way that they're going about doing that. They're doing that also by now actively deploying, for the first time really, um, in a very, very long time, actively deploying their military forces into Syria, for example, into Iraq, for example. Um, I believe, although it's difficult to prove, that they have advisors in Yemen. Um, they certainly uh, attempted to ship some advanced weapons in an ex extremely obvious way. Uh, to support the al-Houthi rebels there. Um, and their deployments match an effort to transform their military to be more deployable. And this is one of the things that we're also watching that has really received very, very little attention, if any. Um, they actually are designing a, their equivalent of a NATO, their equivalent of interoperability among proxies so that Lebanese Hezbollah can work alongside Iraqi Shia militias, can work alongside Iranian Quds Force operatives, can work alongside Iranian law enforcement forces, advisors, can work alongside Iranian IRGC generals. Um, when I, was, I had the opportunity to be in Baghdad uh, in January, and I was uh, frankly a little bit taken aback to see in the center of Baghdad a, a huge billboard uh, with a picture of Brigadier General Takavi who was an IRGC brigadier general who had been killed in Iraq fighting, big martyrdom billboard with the IRGC logo at the bottom. So this is, this is what they're engaged in, and that's just the overt, basically overt military stuff. If you want to talk about support to terrorism, if you want to talk about support across the board in a lot of other areas, then you know, we can talk about that. But they have been expanding and increasing those capabilities and working to increase their ability to expand and increase them at home all the time we've been negotiating this nuclear deal, whatever you think of the deal. Right. And this obviously raises concerns of our, of our allies in the region. Uh, Senator Cotton just mentioned that, uh, John, that they're going to have this uh, meeting at Camp David in a couple of weeks. Um, I think the smart money bets that uh, probably our Arab allies in the region are going to have concerns beyond nuclear weapons. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, I mean, I, I agree with everything Fred has just said, that um, in the last 10 years, uh, really we've seen the Arab allies going first from being allies to being skeptics, and now uh, to being people who think that their policy is at variance with that of the United States. 
I mean, if you go back to the uh, Egyptian, to the speech Obama uh, made, the President Obama made in Cairo, he plainly was appealing to Iran at that point. But he was also addressing the wider Muslim world, as he thought, and, and uh, asking them, in a sense, to treat the United States as an ally. Of course, the wider uh, Muslim world is divided in two, and they are, at the moment, there's something close to a low-intensity civil war going on between Sunni and Shia. And, uh, and we have not only, are, uh, are we, as, as others have said, um, working with Iran, seeing Iran as a potential long-term ally, but we are making life increasingly difficult for stable regimes um, uh, of, uh, in, um, of the, in the Sunni world. I mean, the, I, I go back to the point I made uh, to the senator. The speech made by Sisi was an extremely important speech. I've no doubt that it's not been um, it's not been matched by uh, actions of similar strength, but nonetheless. It was a challenge to the orthodoxy, much of the, to, the, to the whole Islamist world, and to much of the Islamic world as well. And it, it appealed to them <coughs> to stop regarding the West and the infidels as enemies, but instead uh, to work with them you know, on, on, a, on a different basis. Now, that's something which it seems Western political leaders cannot bring themselves to say with the strength that he did. Yes, we can say, uh, the Muslim world has got to solve this problem for itself, but we, d but we, we don't say, um, and we are going to be right behind those political leaders who will do so. Um, we, 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 in a sense, backtrack. We're so afraid of what we feel was the <coughs> failure of the democracy initiative that we've now stopped representing our own interests in a clear way in, in the sunny world and in the Shia world too. So um, essentially, we have to go, we have to stand back consider the failure of the Obama policy, because actually, if it succeeds, the Obama policy will have failed. Right. Uh, it won't have produced a more secure world, but a more dangerous one, um, and, and we have to do that by going back, in a sense, to first principles in dealing with the Arab world. Different questions apply in other parts of the world. Uh, the most interesting part of Sisi's speech, and, and I think going to your point about how we don't have a, not, not just an American politician, a Western politician mm -hmm. who gets up and, and says what he said, uh, very much echoed in what we heard here yesterday from Ayan Hirsi Ali. Mm -hmm. Not only that uh, the Arab Islamic and, and broader Islamic world needed to have a different relationship with the West, but also that Islam from within needed a revolution of doctrine. And he said very bluntly in a way that you would never hear a Western politician say, you know, look, we have these elements in our scriptures, in our texts, um, which are sacralized calls to war against the infidel. The rest of the world. Um, and that has to be changed. He didn't say, he didn't just say, uh, you know, we need a new relationship. He said that we actually need a revolution in our belief system. Pete, you've dealt on the ground in a way that um, that almost no one in this room certainly has with the, with the different elements that we have to deal with as we try to pursue our interest, as, as difficult as that can be when we're not mm -hmm. clear on what our interests are in that part of the world. Um, how do you think CC's speech and the thought behind it resonates on the ground as opposed to how it's how it's discussed in the journals? I think it, it resonates <clears throat> I think more than we might suspect, but with those who are currently not empowered or are on their heels, uh, precisely because of many of the policies that have pursued been pursued under this administration. You know, I, listening to Tom Cotton, uh, you talk about ground pounders. Uh, I couldn't be more encouraged and proud. Uh, and I think the reflection, the reality that he has, both at a philosophical level and a constitution, he actually paid attention at Harvard, it seems, to the constitution. <laughs> uh, but that connected with someone who's walked the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, had those interactions, seen the enemy firsthand, provides a, a courageous and informed perspective that's been lacking in Washington for a really long time. So you add him to an O'Sullivan, uh, and a and Joni Ernst and everybody else, and you're, we're starting to build a caucus of folks who have been there, got, done there, got the t-shirt, understand what Iran is trying to do on the ground, not just in an academic sense. And certainly in Iraq, the, they meddled 
as much or more than anyone in the outcome there. Uh, he, he talked about it, the, so to that point, I think it, it does resonate more than we think, but uh, what's happening and who's winning on the ground in a military sense matters a lot more than anyone ever talks about. Uh, and when you talk, you, Senator Cotton mentioned uh, Iran and replacing the Iranian regime and the opportunity of that underbelly of what could be possible. And that is, that's what is such a travesty about the manifestation of what happened in Iraq, is if you look at uh, 2003 and the victory there, and 04 and 06, the years of 2004, and when it slid backwards, and then the Iraq surge, which frankly Fred Kagan and a few others were the architects of, and it was implemented with great courage by, by many men and women who went there uh, and did a difficult task. We had that opportunity. We, we, when the Arab Spring happened and when went in the wrong direction, everyone looked around and said, why do we have this false choice between Islamists and dictators? The reality is we had that opportunity in Iraq in the trajectory of where that was going. And this administration was so wedded and interested in uh, maintaining campaign promises, detached from the reality, detached from the fact that there is, a, call it what you want, a democracy project, a freedom project. I think some of that, uh, when you walk the ground, you realize is a bit of hyperbole about what's actually mm -hmm. going to happen. But quasi-stable, quasi-democratic, aligned with America is something we currently barely have in the Middle East. Yes. We could have had it. Uh, so I think I at this point, uh, now we have, we have uh, chaos wrought before us. It's a timing issue of when you engage again and how, and building the consensus behind the kind of project where you start to provide that alternative in the Middle East. Fred? I, I want to I just second what Pete just said and, and, and add to it just the following thought. Someone asked at a, at a dinner that I was at the other night, you know, why don't we have more moderate Muslims standing up uh, against this extremism and, and sort of indicating their willingness to work with us? And my answer is, they do. Pete fought alongside them. They stood up with us in Iraq. They stood up with us in Afghanistan. They've tried to stand up in Syria. They've tried to stand up in Libya. And everywhere, we have abandoned them. That's right. We have asked them to stand up and fight with us. I was standing, or sitting rather, Indian style, very uncomfortably for me, <laughs> it, near the mosque in Sangasar village, near where Mullah Omar had first started to preach, speaking with a local elder who had put together on his own a group of Afghans to fight against the Taliban, even before we'd reached out to them. And then we made contact and we were supporting him. And what he said to me rang even more powerfully and emotively than anything I ever heard in Iraq. Because we have this notion that these people will hedge. They won't fight unless we, they're sure that we're going to stay. He said to me, I hope that you will stay. And I hope that you will continue to support us. Because I've already thrown my life in your hands. I already, I'm there. I hope you won't betray us the way you've betrayed us before. Now he died not long after that in combat, and I'm, but I, which is a tragedy, but he was ready for that and we were still fighting with him at that time. We're not in that district anymore. What's happening there? I'm not sure we know. What I do know is that his fears that we would betray the people who had stood up with us at our request sometimes and not at other times are coming true across the board. Who will continue to stand up if they know that we will always abandon them? I, you know, it's, it's an important point. When I, when I first got involved in, in this sort of thing as a lawyer, which is a far removed from where we are, uh, I, I often point out to people that the first people I met in our investigation were not jihadists. The first people I met in our investigation was a patriotic American Muslim who was helping us infiltrate the Blind Sheikh's organization and without whom we could not have thwarted the second plot, which was going to be a massive uh, series of simultaneous attacks. Um, and also the people that we had working for the FBI who were actually helping us whip our evidence into a narrative. I think the problem that we have, and it's still one that we have to get to the bottom of, is how big is the critical mass of our support and how big is the mass of, of our opposition? D 
domestically, our experience was that rank and file Muslims in our communities were very cooperative with our investigations. Now, they didn't want people to know that they were cooperating, and that could be frustrating at times. But the problems we had were not with rank and file people. The problems we had were with the leadership of the, the mosques and the Islamic community centers, very often uh, having connections to Muslim Brotherhood organizations or even being Muslim Brotherhood fronts. And in terms of our foreign policy, the interesting dynamic is um, we have Obama in 2009 making his first big speech uh, in Cairo, insisting over the objection uh, of the then Mubarak regime that the Muslim Brotherhood be there front and center. Uh, and flash forward to today, we not only have in the fallout of the Arab Spring the Muslim Brotherhood now suppressed in Egypt, uh, but remarkable speech by Sisi. Uh, so why can't we piggyback off what Sisi is doing? Why is it that the Egyptians and the other countries that know the Muslim Brotherhood a lot better than we do have a sensible policy, or at least are coming down heavily on the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and we're still listening to the heads of these Islamist organizations, and they still have carte blanche and, and the red carpet in terms of informing our policy. Uh, could I step yeah, on this please. one? Um, it, it seems to me that the f they're just a very small point, the f uh, which is that, frankly, a lot of people in the foreign policy establishment, particularly the left and particularly the present administration, don't take seriously the democratic credentials of anyone who's on our side. They tend to think that if they're on our side, there must be there's something wrong with them. Now, um, in the case of, we're dealing with two points. We're dealing, first of all, with the military situation and with the underlying ideological or philosophical one. In relation to the uh, to, to military intervention, uh, um, Fred, you are absolutely right that again and again we've let people down. We've gone in there and we've, they've put their lives on the line, they've taken positions, and then we've withdrawn, and they've been uh, forced to take the consequences. The British did it before very often, the French did it in Algeria. People get buried alive in those situations, and this is something we should be ashamed of. What it seems to me it follows is, we should not intervene and ask for their support unless we are serious, determined to stay the course. We have to know that we're not going in and coming out. We can't rely on light footprints. We have to have in our foreign policy world and in our military people who will see their lives as being spent very largely outside the United States in these situations. A um, hundred years ago, if you were if you, in the British Empire, people did go out for 30 or 40 years. That was expected. We live in a different world. People who want to make a lot of money on Wall Street don't want to spend too many years uh, in you know, hot climates uh, with bad air conditioning. But, but, but nonetheless, as a, foreign, a serious foreign policy country, the United States has got to be prepared to make cold analyses of whether or not it can uh, achieve a change and a willingness to commit itself for the long haul to that. Um, if it's not prepared to do that, it should ask other people to take risks which, be, which are not trivial, which are not serious to us, but which are life, t life or death risks for them. And, and that, I think, is the main point. The reason why some of us were skeptical about the Syrian intervention was it looked that by the time we were preparing to assist the rebels, that we were backing the losing side of the losing side. And unless we're going to intervene substantially at the right time, and um, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't play imperial games lightly. On the m moral point, I completely agree with you. And here, the battle has to be fought, not simply in the Islamic world, but in the world of the Western intelligentsia, which at the moment can't find itself prepared to stand up for free speech if it offends people. Uh, the, the sight of people resigning from Penn because Penn is giving an award to Charlie Hebdo is an absolute disgrace. And we should... Uh, and you know, and, and, and people who write for a living and, and, and do other things like that, we should actually condemn the authors of the, the, of the resigning letter. Yeah. A couple, couple, I'll just yeah, back sure. on that briefly. There's two, I think there's two seductions at play here. You touched on both of them. Uh, the first is, is after Iraq and the difficulty of Iraq and Afghanistan and the, and the massive investment and the time, 
Uh, there was, of course, a very easy argument to be made that it was from the air, light footprint, counterterrorism is the approach of the future. Uh, and it was tried very directly in Libya. Uh, and in Libya, where, the, where it was an air campaign, swift, fast, nothing on the ground, uh, topple the regime, uh, and, and America comes in and out. And it was touted early on. Uh, quite publicly as a success by this administration. Libya today is an abject disaster. It is, it, ISIS is seizing all, all uh, three main areas of, of the country and working with, with elements on the ground to do just that. Uh, it isn't just Benghazi in that incident. I mean, the country itself is sliding into complete Islamist chaos uh, because of the policies pursued uh, that were never thought through and never followed through on. And as a result, we make the situation much worse. Juxtapose that with what was possible, which what we could have done in Iraq from during that same time frame, and you have two very different. So it's seductive to think light, fast, gone is the way to do it. Uh, there are moments where, of course, that makes sense, but investment over time in these places, uh, and there's ways you can do it better than others, and the critiques about nation building and others, and, and level of involvement are, of course, very legitimate conversations to be had, and those, that, those of us that were a part of nation building projects saw many of the pitfalls of certain approaches when you go too far in certain areas, but, and, and you don't re realize that security is the, the most important aspect of what you, you apply and provide in these, in these areas. The second seduction is that about uh, of the nature of Islam and, and Islamism in the, in the country today. Uh, we are teaching every single member of our, of our youth and in our higher education that, of course, Islam is by default a religion of peace. And what, what, what I say is it is not a religion of peace, nor is it a religion of war. It's a religion of submission. Submission to the text. Submission either peacefully or through coercion or violently. Uh, and those most radical elites in, in a revolutionary sense, both Sunni and Shia, see it as such, and they leverage as many as possible through coercion to advance that particular perspective. That's why I think the biggest question in, in the world today is whether or not, to the CC speech and everything else, Islam is truly capable of some sort of a reformation where those who don't emphasize the most violent aspects of the text are able to overcome those who do. That, that is the question today. It's a big question, but Another big question is, how much do we tie our national security to defining what Islam is? It seems that uh, you know Western politicians want to weigh in about what the true Islam is and and what it teaches, uh, and they do it obviously in a in a political way. I've always wondered what they thought they were accomplishing, since the people that we're trying to influence really don't care what we think about Islam. I often think you know. Um, Sheikh Yusuf Karadawi, who is the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, probably chief jurisprudent of Sharia, um, and ha has issued you know any number of fatwas supporting suicide bombing and, and many of the things that they uh, do in the in, in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. He is probably the most influential Sunni cleric in the world. Okay, how many people in this room even know who he is? How many people in this room wonder before they go to sleep at night what Sheikh Karadawi thinks of them and thinks of the West? Um, I, I, I just often wonder who is it that we're trying to impress when we go into into this uh, rhetoric about Islam? And you know, the fact of the matter is, whether a literalist, jihadist perspective of Islam or something reformist that Ayan Hirsi Ali gave a vision of to us yesterday, whether that ultimately prevails one way or the other, we have to defend the United States regardless of who wins there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of trying to d divine our strategies, particularly with respect to ISIS, Fred, you've made the point recently uh, that they're better understood uh, as an insurgency rather than just a, a terrorist organization. Um, Talk about how, talk about why that's important and how, why it's important to diagnose the problem before we can formulate a sensible strategy on it. Yeah, so um, look, first of all, I need to, uh, uh, you know, Andy and I don't fully agree on the, on the diagnosis of the global problem, and I don't want to get into a big argument. I just do want to enter a demur. Small here arguments, though. <laughs> that I, I, don't, I don't agree that the problem is Islam in the same way. I do agree with you that um, we have these incredibly narcissistic, 
uh, speeches by politicians on all sides about the nature of Islam that are fundamentally aimed at persuading ourselves that the world is the way that we would like it to be. And that is the most dangerous thing that people can ever possibly do. So I think a valid, uh, a, a real discourse, and, and you know, you and I have legitimate disagreements based on different interpretations of facts about what is actually going on in Islam. But the notion that we're going to solve any of these problems, as some of our political leaders think, by persuading ourselves that the world is the way that we, we wish it were, um, is fantasy. And we really need to get focused on reality. Well, so, l l but let me let me ask you. I'm not trying to push back on on Islamic doctrine because I think it, it's secondary. What I understand you to be saying and and Pete to be saying is that to go back to uh, Bin Laden's way of putting it, the strong horse, weak horse thing is probably more important than right. doctrine. Yeah. That that whether whether we go in with a purpose and keep our commitments is far more important in our containment or co confrontation of, of the threat to us than what the specifics of Islamic doctrine may be, whatever they are. Right, and I think you know my li very limited understanding of Sunni Islam tells me one thing, which is that it is a religion that believes that worldly success indicates divine support and that worldly failure generally indicates the lack of the divine support, much more than Shiism, which is a religion of the oppressed and, and it doesn't work that way in Shiism. But if a group is succeeding in the Muslim world, in the Sunni world, it's relatively easier for that group to make the argument that it's because Allah wills it so. So if you want to make a doctrine look bad in the eyes of Sunni, making it fail is extremely important. And this is not unique in the Muslim world either. How did we defeat communism? Because we did defeat communism outside of the American academ academia, you know, <laughs> where it, it continues to triumph. But, you know, in, in most states around the world, uh, so American academia, North Korea, Cuba, China, and a couple of other places, it, there are redoubts still of communism, but generally the ideology was defeated. How? We defeated it by defeating the Soviet Union, which had become the embodiment of communism. What's the embodiment of jihadism today? Not Islamism, but jihadism is Al-Qaeda and its franchises, and ISIS has been making a bid to say that the most successful franchise is the one that is most brutal. And to the extent that we allow ISIS to succeed, we are allowing that narrative to succeed, that not only is Islamism right and divinely supported, that not only is jihadism right and divinely supported, but that the most extreme, brutal, apocalyptic vision of those things is right and divinely supported. That's the risk that we run when we allow these guys to try to succeed. Now, it was actually, I think, Jessica Lewis at the Institute for the Study of War who first really started demonstrating that ISIS had become an insurgency a couple of years ago. It's no longer an insurgency. Now, it's a fielded army. We need to recognize that. We have, this is not a terrorist organization, nor is it an insurgency. These guys are maneuvering mechanized vehicles and artillery against other forces that have mechanized vehicles and artillery. That's not an insurgency, friends. That's a war. And that's what ISIS has at its disposal. It's what Jabhat al-Nusra has at its disposal. And just to make another point, I'm, I have no doubt that you will agree with me on this one. The fixation on ISIS is leading us into a situation where we may well end up supporting the takeover of Syria by an al-Qaeda affiliate called Jabhat al-Nusra. Except that we then make another absolutely insane argument to ourselves about how we need to ally with Iran instead. And then we talk about, well, you know, Roosevelt reached out to Stalin. Allow me to make a historical point. Roosevelt's alliance with Stalin, although the right thing to do at the time, represented the, an apocalyptic failure of policy for the preceding two decades that we had reached the position where we had to ally with and support the Soviet Union was a catastrophic failure of American and Western foreign policy. I would submit to you that we have, the fact that we have reached the point in the Middle East where we have to have discussions about allying with the Iranian regime against ISIS represents a cataclysmic failure of American foreign policy. I want to turn, because we, we have limited time, I want to turn away from this for a moment and, get, and jump into 2016 a bit. Um, John, what do you think the effect of having Rand Paul in the race as a candidate is in terms of the foreign policy debate and perhaps even sharpening our thinking about 
foreign policy? Oh, I think it's altogether a good thing. I mean, I don't agree with Rand Paul on uh, foreign policy questions and probably on a lot of other questions too. And my view of libertarianism is that it's a heresy of conservatism. You know, the, uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, there's a definition of heresy by Chesterton, which he says uh, a heresy is where you take part of the truth and expand it so it becomes the whole truth. And that, I think, is what libertarianism is. Conservatism balances various things. Liberty is the main one, perhaps, but order, authority, um, the distribution of power through the community. A lot of factors are balanced in the conservative uh, vision. And um, so I'm, I'm not on Rand Paul's side, but I agree. He sharpens the debate. Um, the libertarian arguments remind us of things which when we're considering everything else, we sometimes forget. Um, and, it's, and it very often produces, I think a Reason Magazine over the years has demonstrated this, very good practical proposals for making our lives better and everything from traffic policy um, to bu the budget. Now, the one area where I think it's pretty well close to useless is foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because the, the, the basic principle in foreign policy is act prudently, and libertarians basically throw prudence out of the window when they begin to approach these things. Um, um, but I think that he's going to fight a good fight. He's a personable candidate. He's a decent guy. He has su considerable support. We have to demonstrate in all our political debates that l the people who lose arguments are given the opportunity to make arguments first. And then, so I think that he will be given that opportunity and I think he will lose. And I hope he does, uh, not maliciously, because he has a important part to play, but I think uh, other candidates, the senator today uh, is not a candidate, but you can see the kind of thinking that I think we would prefer uh, to have dominating the Republican Party, and I think we uh, that's going to have to come about. And, uh, the, yeah. uh, and I, I think it will. Let me, let me ask you one other thing about this uh, along the same lines. Um, we have a lot of governors and people from outside the political system. I think we're going to hear from Carly Fiorina, in fact, uh, at lunch today. But we have uh, a number of governors who don't deal with foreign policy as a regular diet. We have uh, Ms. Fiorina, we have Dr. Carson perhaps coming in. Um, John, your recollection of uh, Margaret Thatcher when she was about to become prime minister, uh, not somebody who was steeped in foreign policy matters and yet who really became a towering figure. Uh, yes. Well, it's very simple. She wasn't steeped in foreign policy matters, and she knew it. Um, but she um, always, in all her dealings, she never wanted to be presented with a single point of view. She didn't just want the official advisors. She always went outside the magic circle and brought people from outside, sometimes people who completely horrified the civil service. <laughs> uh, but but, but um, it was important for her to feel she had the full uh, range of choices. And what she did immediately after becoming leader, and I know this personally because I was the intermediary in a way, uh, was she contacted Robert Conquest. Um, the, she, I was a friend, um, her political secretary, Richard Ryder, was a friend of mine. I was sharing an apartment with, uh, with Bob. Uh, he contacted me, I brought them together, and he wrote the first of the two Iron Lady speeches. And he continued to be an advisor for her throughout her time in opposition and government, along with other people, like Ellie Kaduri was brought in, um, so was um, Hugh, I'm sorry, I haven't got his name out, the historian of the Spanish Civil War. The whole series of conservative uh, thinkers on foreign policy were brought in, she heard their points of view, and they affected her. She took uh, the strong position she took, particularly um, in the war, in the Falklands War, in the Cold War, and in the period in opposition, testify to their influence and to the wisdom of making sure you don't just have one set of advisors giving you what is very often the Foreign Office view. Which, from which all common sense has been cleansed. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, if you had the uh, ear of our candidates in, the, in, in 2016, what would you tell them about what we need in the way of military readiness and having a military that's actually suitable to what we're going to be asking them to do on the ground? Yeah. No, you, you read my mind, actually. That, that's what I was, was going to mention next, is that obviously it, with a foreign policy, you've got multiple different levels you can put, levers you pull, diplomatic, economic, uh, uh, informational, uh, but the military undergirds that, that belief 
the projection of any power you have. Peace through strength, peace is maintained through real strength, both the perception of it and the reality of it and the ability to project it. Uh, any, if, if we get a strong, freedom-loving uh, president uh, in 2016, uh, they're not going to be able to immediately turn on the switch and project a military uh, the way you know, Ronald Reagan was able to hand that to his predecessor. Uh, we've got serious readiness problems in this military today, serious morale problems, uh, serious uh, caving out or, or carving out of key leaders, real war fighters, uh, have been squeezed out of, of the military uh, by, by leaders more concerned about social policy and social engineering than about war fighting. Uh, so the, the, next, the next commander in chief is going to have to uh, effectively rearm uh, in many ways. And I, I think we've got a serious reform problem as well at the Department of Defense. As much as I'm a pro-defense guy, our acquisitions process is fundamentally broken. Uh, we're getting weapons too late to the battlefield, uh, paying too much for it, uh, and they're not meeting the needs of what our, our guys need. Uh, 100%. Uh, if you want to weigh in on that? So, yeah. so, I mean, it, 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 and it, our pers the personnel budget is also growing uh, quicker than it should. And then you've got top-line restrictions that this administration, through sequestration, have crushed our military with. So we're not, we don't have, uh, the, the tip of the spear is not as sharp as it once was. And the next president is going to need to address that immediately to ensure that, our, that the strength we need can be projected. Fred, I, I was yeah. going to ask you to weigh in on that, but also, um, the difficulty we have in making sure that we have the, the military that we need and that we, the spending that we need on it when we're in a, a, a budget situation where basically if we make concessions on military spending and we get the kind of military spending we want, it's hard to put pressure on progressives to give us the reform of entitlements and, and the like that we need. How do we address that? Yeah, so I've got a great way for not getting myself invited back to these kinds of events. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm, what I'm going to say here is, positing all of the ills of the Obama administration and the Democratic caucus, it is time for the Republican Party and the congressional Republicans to look in a mirror and recognize the very serious responsibility they bear for the disastrous situation our military is in today. Sequester was a bipartisan policy that the Republicans fully supported and that the Republicans continue to support for various fiscal reasons, which I don't want to get into, but I'm here to tell you that if, you, if to you being a fiscal hawk means defending sequester in any way, you are not a foreign policy hawk, period, full stop. We cannot reform the Defense Department, maintain the military that we need, rebuild, recover from the damage that's been inflicted by the wars, by this White House, and by Congress, by still having a sequester top line. Cannot. And until Republicans face up to that reality, we are not going to get anywhere on national security. Now, on procurement reform, again, the, the Defense Department is a wonderful scapegoat. There's no organization really in the world other than the IRS, maybe that it's easier to, to wail on for being inefficient and bloated and all of that kind of stuff. And of course it's inefficient and bloated. I, I bet they the, can find all their emails, so. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's not put that to the test, shall we? <laughs> but why is the procurement system the way that it is? Is it the way that it is because some generals thought that it would be a great idea to have this ridiculous procurement system? No, every aspect of the procurement system is legislated by Congress largely for the purpose either of being able to control how defense dollars are spent in order to cut up the pie in an appropriate way, which is very understandable in a democratic society, but is a problem that is a Congress problem, not a Pentagon problem, or out of the insane notion that it is feasible to account for every single penny in a $600 billion budget, and that if you can't, the solution is having more people counting pennies. I am still looking for a number that gives me the percentage of how many people in the Pentagon or in the military generally have as their job figuring out how many people there are in the military or how much money is being spent where and what percentage of the Defense Department budget goes to figuring out how the Defense Department budget is being spent. This is fundamentally a Congress problem. And going back and hammering on service chiefs and telling them you need to be more efficient when they don't have authorities to change the way they do procurement is just disingenuous. So the, the cause of this problem is largely in Congress. The solution to this problem 
has to come from Congress. This is something where Congress is going to have to make some very painful decisions and wrestle with some very, very ugly things that it has created if there's going to be any prospect for serious reform in the Pentagon. And, and thankfully, I think we're starting to see some of that. I mean, McCain and, and Thornberry both have introduced uh, acquisitions reform as well as personnel reform. Uh, but I think to your, to your point about the larger deal and, and, and uh, mandatory spending, uh, we, we, get, we get the high ground on that by saying, well, first of all, we recognize you can't balance the budget on the backs of the Defense Department. You're never going to do it. There's not enough to, to squeeze to make that happen. Plus, anyone, libertarian or conservative, has to acknowledge that providing for the common defense is the one thing the federal government must and ought do for us as a free peoples who, who govern ourselves and must defend ourselves and still the guarantor of that freedom. It is us or nobody else. We do not have the convenience of turning to our little brother, uh, no, no, no offense here, after World War II and say <laughs> the world's yours. Uh, there is no little brother after the United States in the 21st century. It is us or nobody. Either we have a military that can underwrite that or not. So all of that understood as a preface by doing the smart things to, to spend dollars more wisely at the Pentagon, you can then turn around to those on the left and say, it's your turn with mandatory spending programs that are actually bankrupting us. Now it's time to make a deal that fixes that problem. Let me, let me try to get to a couple of audience questions before we go. John, do we need a radio-free Middle East? Oh, we certainly, you know, we certainly need, uh, and not just the United States, but Western European countries, and particularly the Brits, to re build and revamp the, um, the, the Western, uh, well, fundamentally it was the radios in the past, but it's the system of official uh, broadcasting. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Russians, uh, the Iranians, everybody is spending enormous amounts of money. You see, probably most of you, the product of that in R Russia Today, RT, which is a very slick, sophisticated, completely <laughs> dishonest uh, media operation, uh, which mimics Western programs and does some of them better than we do, but which is fundamentally an agent of uh, Putin's propaganda. Now, exactly what we should do, I think that's a very complicated question um, because the uh, official broadcasting has got to obey certain rules uh, in, in, in decent countries, and at the same time, it, you've got a very big media world out there in which it's hard to make an impact. But there's no doubt about it that the BBC World Service, for example, and I would say this, uh, I used to work for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and we did a good job. But the world's reputation of the, of the BBC World Service is enormously high, and yet successive British governments has regarded it as a, uh, as a basis, a, a, an easy way to save funds. That's absolutely ridiculous, and the same is true also here, where the uh, Congress has been, uh, could be 10 times as generous as it is being. The, the sums against the rest of the American budget, the US budget, are trivial. Uh, about two helicopters is what we used to say the cost of Radio Free Europe was. <laughs> but so you could expand the funds, uh, you could expand the production uh, and the, the, the broadcasting and the coverage enormously at very modest cost. And I have to say, finally, I've had lots of jobs in journalism in my life, but I have never been prouder to work with people of the quality I worked with at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, people who had made real sacrifices whose lives had been on the, on the line, some of whom were killed in the course of their reporting duty, and, and yet who, and, and who nonetheless, um, constant, had been provided a consistently balanced, decent, and uh, intelligent coverage. And I, I think the American people and Congress can be proud of what they did, but the only thing is, we need to give them the ability now to do more. I, I, I'm, I'm I'm really sorry to sound the buzzer because I only have about 2,000 questions I'd, I'd like to ask as a follow-up to this wonderful panel. And thank you all very much for, uh, for appearing, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Well done, sir. Thank you, Andrew.